and I just start digging in on whatever they're talking about. Okay. Mm. So it's, it's a lot of times on these TV shows and my wife's really, really good at it. Actually women, not to get off topic, but women generally are better at body language than men are. And the reason why is women have 14 to 16 emotional receptors in the brain. Men have about six to eight. I so, knew you all were lacking. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. The Police Polygraph with Detective Eddie Pearson, Part 2. The, when I do my interviews or I'm doing a polygraph exam, I take each individual person on their own. Everybody's body language is a little bit different. Everybody's statement analysis is a little bit different. Um, some of it has to do with, with cultural, you know, wh where you're from, how you were raised. So you have to take each person independently and adjust as you go because not everybody's body language or statement analysis is the same sure. and not everybody will respond um, on a polygraph the same. Um, now, having said that, let me, let me, let me kind of clear this up. A polygraph exam not only detects deception, it also detects the concealment of information. And there's mm. a little bit of difference between the two. Let's say, for instance, you were accused of robbing a bank and I were giving you a polygraph test. I may ask you, did you steal any of the money? Were you present when the money was stolen? Were you in possession of any money after it was stolen? If I ask you all those questions and you say no, which you would, because if you say yes, you wouldn't be taking the test. So you may say no to all those questions and tell, be, or be telling me 100% of the truth. But what you left out was that you were the getaway driver. So everything that I ask you, you told me 100% of the truth, but you can still fail the test because you concealed your participation in the bank robbery. That's the problem with polygraph. Because a lot of times people will say, well, I told 100% of the truth and I still failed that test. That proves that that polygraph test doesn't work. No, what it proves is that you probably didn't tell me something about your participation in this bank robbery. And I may not have known to ask you the question about you driving the car because that information wasn't given to me before um, I give you the test. So the main focus I tried it to to look at is I want to make sure that I'm asking everybody good qualifying questions. And I want to get as much information as I can from the detective so I can do the best polygraph exam I can do to get as much information there as I go. can get. So a lot of times when detectives don't know this, what I'll do is I'll just ask like a participation. Did you participate in any way? And this is what participation means. You planned it, you did it, you helped cover it up, conceal it, or failed to report it after you knew it was done. And that usually covers that. But if I don't know to ask that question, I can't ask it. That explains a lot. So sure. that explains a lot. Right. So yeah. a lot of people that, you know, you read on the internet and says, well, I was 100% honest and I failed that test. Well, there's a reason you failed it. And it was probably because there's more information you didn't provide because maybe someone didn't know to ask you the question. There we go. So that, that's logical. Yeah. Cause I remember uh, we had one that, uh, uh, they didn't they could, didn't see anything on the polygraph and it was a shooting and a murder and then uh, the the kid that did it ended up testifying and that he shot the person and I'm going back in my mind now I'm like mm -hmm. probably what it was because he had a, he had a uh, co-defendant right. is it was probably something like that and now now looking back that would be logical is that he said he probably just skated by on, on, on the nuances mm -hmm. of semantics maybe it, or and something. it could have been the way yeah. the question was asked cause true. Because when I ask my questions, I try to be as detailed as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a person was stabbed and was murdered, um, that's the question I want to ask. Did you stab that person? Not yeah. did you kill that person? Ah, because go. killing the person could, you know, well, no, I stabbed them, but I didn't kill them. They died at the hospital due to an infection. So that ain't on me. Yeah. People try to justify it that way. Oh, I have no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Um, so I try to, you know, I try to talk to the detectives. I'm like, what do you want to know? Well, I want to know if he stabbed him in the chest. Good. I'll ask that question. Did you mm -hmm. stab that person in the chest? And that's a yes or no question mm -hmm. versus yeah. did you kill that person? 
Gotcha. It's kind of kind of vague. So I try to be as specific as I possibly can. Okay. So and, and back to it again, just because I hear these kind of things and you know, straight rumors out. Are there any um, diagnosed mental health conditions that people could be labeled with? They would be challenging. Like a common thing I hear a lot is if they're antisocial or sociopathic or psychopathic or maybe a narcissistic personality disorder, are they more of a challenge? Do they have or anything? Is there any science that says that's true? No. Basically, what happens is I ask everybody the same series of questions. You know, do you know the difference between right and wrong? They say yes. Who taught you that? My grandmother. Okay. How did she teach you? Well, when I did something wrong, I got my butt spanked. Okay. So now you know the difference between right and wrong. Yeah, when I did something wrong, I got punished. You can take a polygraph. Ah. Right. Oh, because yeah. you know the difference between right and wrong. There we go. Where it comes into is, you know, when people have mental conditions, they're not medically suitable to take a polygraph. Right. Um, is there some other medical condition um, that an examiner doesn't believe that they're suitable to take a polygraph? Of course, you don't give them a polygraph. Yeah. But in my experience, um, if you ask somebody a series of questions and they can explain to you the difference between right and wrong, especially when I did something wrong, what would happen to me? I got punished. So, you know, when you do something wrong, you get punished. Well, yeah, it happened to me as a kid. Mm. They know the difference between right and wrong. Ah, so as long as you can establish that, you can test them. Mm. Oh, wow. Cool beans. Straightening a lot of BS up that I've heard for a long time, too. Uh, Speaking of that, another place that this comes into, there's a lot of misconceptions and stuff like that is because you talked about on a TV show, the the mock court kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. When can polygraphs come into a a courtroom and when can't they? If you can just give some general guidelines, maybe. A lot of people say um, polygraphs are not admissible in court. Right. Okay. Well, that's true in most cases. I've testified in court a number of times on polygraph. Some of the judges say, I want to know what you said in the pre-test interview. That's before I give them the test. I want to know what was said in the post-test interview. If they fail the exam, then I give them a post-test interview so they can explain what caused those physiological reactions that caused them to fail the test. Sure. So some judges only want to hear the pre-test and the post-test. Uh, they don't want to know anything about polygraph, what questions were asked, anything. Other judges, uh, when I've been into court, they want to know everything. They want to know the questions you ask, why you ask that question. They want to know what the charts look like. They want to know everything. So in most cases, polygraphs are not admissible in court, but it's kind of up to the judge. New Mexico is the only state, as of right now that I'm aware of, uh, New Mexico is the only state that actually has laws on the books when it pertains to polygraph as far as the court appearance goes. Uh, I was, I've been told a couple of weeks ago that Indiana is trying to start some laws hmm. and put it on their books. But as of right now, New Mexico is the only one that actually has established laws when it comes to polygraph in hmm. courts. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So it may not always be like a, a part of a proof case or anything, but it definitely is going to come in, I guess, as far as. The whole how we got somebody maybe to confess or something is that yeah, what you're saying? Could, there yeah, we go. Yeah, 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 exactly. Based on their statements. Yeah, gotcha. Could, yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Okay, back to exams because uh, you've thrown a couple words out before. Uh, criminally involved, I think, was one of them or something like that. Sure. As a polygraph examiner, what kind of exams do you do in a, any given year? Okay. Or what could you um, ask to do? For our specific department, we do pre-employment exams and we test uh, the police department, fire department. Uh, at one point, we tested uh, corrections officers. We test uh, E911 operators, dispatchers, and we test anybody that's a civilian that works in police headquarters. Gotcha. Uh, we also do them for other agencies that request them. Uh, we also do criminal specific tests. Right? Uh, if a detective is working a case and he thinks a polygraph would assist in the case, we can do a criminal specific test. Um, and I also do ICAC testing. ICAC is uh, Internet Crimes Against Children. Mm. Basically, what happens is uh, if a detective does a search warrant and they find child porn on a computer, I can do an ICAC test to determine if the uh, suspect is a hands-on offender. And we're doing that looking for unreported victims. So those are the general tests that we do. And we'll do probably 375 pre-employments a year and probably 30 to 40 criminal tests a year. Gotcha. So, but just in those circumstances, so somebody at a department store can't come and say, would you test these seven people for me that I think took a mink coat? Or yes it, and no. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a thing out there called the EPPA, Employee Polygraph Protection Act. 
-hmm. It was uh, signed by President Reagan in 1988. And what it does, it protects private companies or employees uh, that work for private companies. So if a detective is working a case, we can do a polygraph exam on the employees if they agree to do it based on the investigation. But we cannot do it based on the employer requesting they do it. That applies to all private businesses except for government agencies and armored car companies Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. But everybody else falls under the EPPA Act. So if an an employer came to you and you work for, say, a retail store and he says, I think you've done something, I want you to go take a polygraph test. They can't do that because that's a violation of that of the EPPA. But if a detective is working that case, we can do it in re- in reference to his investigation. Gotcha. But they can't make you take it. But it's all a, polygraph tests are volunteer. Exactly. They're, that's a good thing to put in there yeah. too. But it's not like it's not the same thing as the retailer holding your job over your head. Is what I'm getting yeah, at. Yeah, is that it would be solicited by the detective to do that. Fascinating. And, and if we do give that test under the EPPA Act. We can only release the polygraph results to the detective. The employer is not allowed to have those results okay. because they can't use the results to discipline the employee in any way. Yeah. So we only release our test results in those particular cases to the detective. That sounds fair. Wow. Sounds fair um, for sure. Uh, well, let's let's go into it. It, what about you, Wendy? I don't want to jump ahead on topics because in case you've got something that is picking your brain, but. Well, I guess think mostly what I was wondering, you were talking about, <clears throat> and I'm not necessarily referring to the employee polygraph, but do you get with the detective that's working a particular criminal case to judge what questions, or because you've done this so long, do you already have kind of your series of questions that you like to ask? Basically, what I do is... Um, I don't have a set of questions. Like I don't have rape questions, burglary questions. I don't have those set questions. What happens is the detective will call me and say, hey, I'm working a case. Uh, This is the synopsis of the case. Do you think you can do a polygraph? Absolutely. So he'll send me his case file and I'll read everything in his case file. And then we'll bring in um, the individual that's been accused or whatever they've been accused. And I base my questions on uh, what the detective wants to know and what I discovered during the interview. So um, if it's, say, a burglary, right, each burglary, I can't use the same exact questions on every single burglary because each burglary may be different. Mm-hmm. So I have to adjust the questions on what I think the best questions are to ask on this specific case. So you kind of tailor each question for each particular interview. Exactly, yeah. Right. It, it's not unlike uh, we interviewed Greg Davis and talked about medical and forensic pathology and uh, the importance of having an investigator there at the autopsy or close to it, mm-hmm. because that dictates the same thing with a, a, a forensic pathologist mm-hmm. as to what they're going to look at and not look at. Neat stuff. I'll guarantee you people are out there shaking their heads right now that, that, because I am for sure. And I was a little closer to the game. It's almost embarrassing. So it, I knew how to send people to the box, yeah. but I just didn't understand how it worked. You didn't know what box. happened with, I was always got on in there. The, I was on the side waiting for the big one. You know, come on, bro, pull it <laughs> home, call me and say that they, they fell on their knees and assumed the fetal position. And well, well, what I do is, um, and not everybody does this, but what I do is if the detective wants um, a polygraph, I make them come and watch me do the polygraph. Oh, I can't imagine not. Because yeah. usually something comes out in a pretest interview that they didn't know about. Yes. So there's always, not always, but usually more information. And I don't know what that information is that's important to them because it's not my case. So there may be something that's very trivial to me. You know, um, you know, the guy may have owned two cars and he told the detective he owned one, for instance. Well, that second car may have been the car that the crime was committed in and nobody knew about it because he didn't tell anybody about it. hundred percent. So then it comes out in the polygraph about the vehicles that he owns. And the detectives, well, I never knew he owned two vehicles. Well, that gives him another road to go down to continue their investigation. hundred percent. So yeah. I always have the detectives come and watch it because you never know what they may say 
that gives them additional information. Yeah, always watch. Now, is the detective yeah. in there with you, or you all no, take some breaks and you kind of? No, he. We record everything. Uh, every one of our polygraphs are both record audio and video. So when I'm giving a polygraph test, it's just me and the examinee in the room, and then the uh, detective or whoever's watching the polygraph usually watches it from my office. Okay. And so, and we record everything, and then once we're done, we give it to the detective, and he books it into evidence or whatever they, whatever they do with it. But they watch the whole thing from it from. Us. So, if he comes up with another question, do you all maybe kind of pause and take a break so he can say, "I need for you to ask about this when you go back." Yeah, what I do is once I've done my pre-test interview, and that can be anywhere from I don't know forty-five minutes to two and a half hours, just depends on how much we talk about. Uh, we generally take a break. Um, I'm getting older, so I, you know, I need a little break every now and then. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then I'll go in and I'll, uh, you know, let the examinee take a break, go to the bathroom, get a drink of water. Uh, if they want to go outside and smoke a cigarette, what, whatever they need to do. Uh, and then while I'm, while they're doing that, taking their break, I'll go talk to the detective. I say, is there anything else you want me to ask about? Anything we need to follow up on? Is there something that you didn't know about that you want me to dig into? And so we always talk to the detective. Um, to find out if there's anything else we need to talk about. Um, I develop the questions while the examinee is on the break. He comes back in, the examinee. I go over all the questions and I go over all the answers before I even give him the test because I don't want the questions to surprise him. Mm -hmm. So we go over everything. Everything's 100% transparent. The detective knows the questions. The examinee knows the questions. We talk about everything. Um, For instance, you know, if I'm going to ask a participation question, I'll say, this is what I mean by participation. You plan it, you do it, help cover up concealment, fail to report it. That way they can't come back, and it's happened. I've learned from experience. I wasn't really too sure what you meant by participation. Oh, well, sure. That, you know. And so a lot of times I'll ask them, what, what, what's, this, what's participation mean to you? What's the word voluntarily mean to you? Mm-hmm. you know, and I'll have them explain it to me. Um, because that way I am sure that they know exactly what we're talking about, and there's no... Um, thoughts about maybe he understands it, maybe he do- doesn't. Right. Because if I start thinking that, then I stop and say, what does this word mean to you? Oh, just, there we go. Just yeah. to make sure we're all on the same sheet of music. Yeah. Right? So, exactly. Yeah. Too cool. Too a lot cool. of times in rape cases, I'll have them to explain to me what consent is. What's consent? Oh. What's consent to yeah. you? What does the word consent mean to you? Oh, this is what it means. And then, okay. Yeah, because, we'll, you know, here. just thinking off the top oh. of my head, um, yeah, the, what that means from being in an interview room with people who have been accused of that, too. Right. There's a wide degree of or a wide uh, spectrum sure. of what people think consent is. Oh, yeah. And, and it's I'll pretty just ask scary. Them, what's consent mean to you? What's yeah. what it means? And so if I'm satisfied with their explanation, we're good. Oh, you know, and you know, one mm-hmm. of the things you deal with in sexual assaults is, well, they didn't say no. Yeah, well, exactly. Aside from the point that they were passed out on on Xanax, I mean, with liquor at Wild Turkey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not making light of that, but that's what you deal with, is that a lot of, woof, powerful stuff, powerful. Well, kind of danced around this a little bit too, let's take it into it, uh, and just to kind of firm it up a little bit, what a polygraph is not, if because we've talked a lot about what we do, and you've kind of hit a couple of things that it doesn't do, but what, what are some of the misconceptions on that of what it is and it's not? You know, a lot of people call a polygraph a lie detector. Right. A polygraph is not a lie detector. Good. There's Good. no instrument that I'm aware of that will detect a lie. Right. What a polygraph does, it monitors and measures those physiological reactions when you answer a question. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, people refer to it as I'm going to go take a lie detector. Well, sure. we all know what that means. Right. right? But it, it's not a lie detector. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's basically what it is not. Gotcha. Good deal. And we've talked about court and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. we're there. Uh, let's go back to this a little bit. Um, cause I've seen and heard things over the years too. When people are coming to take a polygraph, um, is there a little niche crowd out there that believes they've got the answers on how to deceive you as a polygraph and how to beat the machine? Cause, and I say that cause I remember over the years, remember, you remember this because we were on patrol about the same time mm-hmm. as that with the intoxilizer mm-hmm. that Zima wouldn't activate it. Yeah. Or if you put a silver dime on your tongue before you blew in the X, it would negate it. Yeah. And and people have that. Do you see that same kind of line of BS at polygraphs when people come um, to try? Yes. I do. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people. And one of the questions I, I talk about is let's, during the pretest interview, I'm like, let's talk about the research that you've done on a polygraph. You ever looked it up on the Internet, read a book, oh. seen a TV show? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know this, I know that, I know this, I know that. Oh, okay, well, 
Let me explain to you how that works. And they'll come up with, yeah, you know, I've seen on the internet, you know, put a penny under your, your tongue or put a tack in your shoe yeah. or, you know, they come up with all these, these crazy things. Well, one of the advantages I have that when I'm not actually giving polygraph tests, I do the same research everybody else does. Uh-huh. And the advantage I have is I have four interns that I'm currently teaching. So I'll take the interns in the polygraph room and I'll try those countermeasures to see if they can pick them up. And then I'll have them try to see if I can pick them up. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of research on countermeasures and, uh, and we, we're kind of trained to monitor those kind of things. That's what I Most people who come in, they don't try to beat the polygraph. What they do is they'll try to use countermeasures to enhance their physiological reactions to help themselves. They think it helps them. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem is it actually hurts them. Because if we think that they're using countermeasures, we'll stop the test and disqualify them. Ah, because it, yeah. it, because they can't follow simple instructions. We tell them not to do it. Mm-hmm. And we give them very specific instructions on what they need to do during the test. And so when they start a lot of things that they read on the internet or some things that maybe somebody told them to do or whatever, when we see all that, we immediately stop the test. Gotcha. Interesting. Because right. it's, not, it's not fair for everybody who didn't do it. Yeah. So we, we stop the test and recommend that they're eliminated. Have you ever Uh had to eliminate? It doesn't happen very often, but there are some people who who come in and I I basically tell them in the polygraph, if you try to manipulate this test in any way, um, I'm going to recommend that you're you're terminated from the hiring process because Mm -hmm. it's not fair to people who follow the instructions. Oh, sure. So as long as you tell 100% of the truth, and that's the key, telling 100% of the truth, not 95% of the truth, and you follow my instructions, you shouldn't have any problems. Most people don't have an issue with it. What sure. about on the criminal aspect? Do you tell them as well? Tell them the exact same thing because it's their test. You know, and a lot of times they'll say, well, I'm just here to help you out. Well, this has nothing to do with me. This <laughs> is your, not helping you. Yeah, this is your <laughs> test. Paying you know? a bill, what's you it know? doing? Car yeah, payment? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I ask them I say, in the very, at the very beginning, I say, why are you here? You know, why are you here to take this test? Well, I want to clear my name. Okay, let's move forward. There we go. Right. And so when they come in and say, well, I'm just here to help you out. Well, no, this, this has nothing to do with me. This is all about you. You're here voluntarily. This is your test. Yeah. And so, as you know, and I tell them, as long as you tell 100% of the truth, you won't have any issues. When you start telling 97% of the truth, well, that that's a problem. True. And true. that's it's an integrity issue is what it is. So, yeah, because usually you, in, uh, you'll see people with it if they, if they get a, a, a positive a, a, a decent, a good one. Like if come back, no, whatever your terminology, and we can hit mm-hmm. that. They'll hold on to that like Willy Wonka's golden ticket. I mean, yeah, I mean that's that, you're the integrity part. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, if they don't get a good one, then they've got different names for what happened, and usually they're blaming you all for screwing them or lying to them or something. Yeah, or it's still you know oh, it, that that wasn't a good question. I'm like, well, you answered the question and I allowed you to come up with your own answers to yeah. the question. So mm-hmm. they'll come back and, you know, well, it's the instrument's fault or it's my fault or it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's some, it's never their fault. Never their it's, fault. Yeah, yeah. It's always, and there's always another issue. There's gotta be another problem. Yeah. The problem is you're not telling the truth. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the opportunities because of the pre and the post, I mean, it's mm-hmm. not, uh, cause again, a lot of people, I think that you're thrown into a chair, you're strapped in, you you know, they put the blood pressure cup on, they ask you the amount of questions and goodbye. And that there's so much more, like you said, a pre might run 45 minutes to two hours oh. and, and whatever. And so you've got tons of opportunity to come to the foot of the cross, as they yeah. say. I've been and, in, uh, I've been in criminal tests that take five, six hours. Sure. So yeah. it just, you know, it just depends on how they do and what we talk about. And gotcha. you know, some of them take four hours, some of them take six hours, five or gotcha. six hours. So it and depends. a disqualification, just especially in, in employment, that's probably, you know, that would be like uh, not going for the drug test or, you know, any anything else that you just yeah. stop on the process or don't participate. That's that's reasonable, too. And they probably got a reason they're doing that as well. Neat stuff. Um, that said, and probably intelligent people are listening, putting this together. What advice would you give to anybody who is going to take a polygraph really for any reason, either pre-employment or let's say, God forbid, they're in an environment where they're suspected or people are looking at their involvement in a case, what advice would you give to somebody? There's two things I would say. One is that tell 100% of the truth, regardless of how painful or how embarrassing it is. Do not conceal anything. And the second advice, uh, piece of advice I would give is follow the 
the uh, examiner's instructions. Right. Don't try to manipulate the test. Tell 100% of the truth, 100% of the time. We all make mistakes. We all do embarrassing things in our lives. So talk about it, get it out in the open, and don't try to conceal it, and just follow the examiner's instructions. Mm -hmm. Those two things. If you do yeah. that, you shouldn't have any issues. Yeah, kind of like what we hear from our parents or our grandma. Mm -hmm. You know, just always tell, tell the, the truth, truth and whatnot. Always, yeah. Fascinating stuff. Now, um, have you covered, um, you know, I know you've done a gamut of things. You mentioned criminally. Yeah. I guess you've covered everything from child abuse to murder. Pretty much, yeah. Child yeah. abuse, murder, uh, Rape. burglary, rapes. Yeah. Do, mm -hmm. You know, we've done, if you can think of it, we've I've probably done it. So. It, if you if you move the ball forward legitimately and ethically, which I know it would be on an investigation, how's that feel for you as Eddie when when you when you go in and you spend all this time with this, and you learn that the investigation advanced and and the right person and maybe just as important when we exonerate somebody. Right, I mean, right. we we never want to let that that feeling uh, let that go that that's an important part of this whole thing that mm -hmm. uh, you're still doing and I used to do. Uh, how's that feel inside? You know, it feels good to me um, because not everybody who takes a polygraph test is guilty of what they said they've been accused of. Okay, yes. So when someone comes back, you know, and say it's, you know, a sexual assault and someone was accused of doing this and we give them a test and they passed, for lack of a better term, they passed the test with flying colors. I go to the detective and I say, listen, I don't think this is your man, right? Based on his body language, his statement analysis, his polygraph exam, and I usually have a pretty good idea about based on what they tell me and how they tell me the incident occurred, how they're going to do on the test. Cause I've, I've done probably over 3000 polygraph tests. Mm -hmm. So I usually have a pretty good idea, but it's very satisfying to me when you can go to the detective and say, yes, I would concentrate on this guy. Sure. This is the road I would go down if it was me, or I don't think this is your man. I think, you know, you might want to look at someone else or, you know, maybe go down another avenue, right? So I think it's very helpful to the detective, or I like to think it's helpful to the detective, um, because a lot of times they'll call me back and say, hey, you know, after we did the polygraph test, the guy said this or the guy said that, or, you know, so we get that additional information, which is very helpful to them. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. yeah. And again, you know, it, like you said, it uh, not everybody takes a polygraph is guilty of something. Exactly. It's it, the whole, the whole business is the search for the truth or the closest we can get to the truth at any given moment. Exactly. And I think it's always powerful. It was always a good feeling for me too when we had somebody that was either we suspected or semi suspected or hell came in and falsely confessed and you could rule them out. That's a pretty damn good feeling. It's oh, right yeah. up there with with yeah. actually charge them or put them in prison or whatever too. So And sometimes that occur that will occur in a polygraph, you know. Mm -hmm. Um somebody will have a, a reaction to a test and then you start interviewing them. And one case that I'm thinking about is there was a, a, a lady who, who died in a trailer. She was murdered and the trailer was set on fire. And I tested the son and uh, they did horrible in a test. I tested the father and he still passed the test, but we, or he, I'm sorry, he, he failed the test, but he didn't do as bad as the son did. And so we went back and we discovered that later on that they admitted that, that the father was protecting the son. Ah, and that there was, we go. that was the issue. And so they were both looked at as a suspect, but later on down the road, they discovered that, you know, the son is the one who actually committed the crime, but the father was trying to take the blame to protect the son. So we worked all that out in polygraph. You know? gotcha. So we can use it for that. We can also use a polygraph. Um, a lot of people don't understand this to locate missing people. Ah. And the way we do that, uh, say for instance, there's a murder that's occurred and you're looking for the body. And you know the body's in the state of Kentucky. So we get a map of the state of Kentucky. We divide it into four parts. We ask them, is the body in section A? Is the body in section B? Is the body in section C? Is the body in section D? And we can look at those reactions and start eliminating the sections. So if they had a, a, a reaction to section D, then we get a, a map of Kentucky and blow it up just for section D. And we divide it into four parts again. And we can narrow it down. One of the uh, one of the things they teach the new polygraph examiners is they'll hide a set of keys or something in a building and you start testing the person that you think that hid the keys and you can locate the keys in whatever room they're in by narrowing it down. So a lot of times you can use a polygraph um, to locate items, locate bodies. We can use it for a lot of different things. 
Holy wow! Molly. I never would yeah, have thought of that. It makes complete I'm sense. I'm going to just be honest. I'm floored. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, a lot of stuff that, that that I just didn't do. How about Ed? Can you think of any other like? Uh, and you don't have to go into detail on names or anything like mm-hmm. that. But can you think of any other anecdotal stories of, of cases you participated in that were shocking or that uh, that the the polygraph really played another strong role in? Um, sexual assault and a divorce. Okay. Uh, People were going through a divorce. One person was accused of sexually assaulting the 12 year old daughter. And we test the suspect and exoner- it didn't, did not happen. Okay? Mm-hmm. Didn't happen based on body language statement analysis, polygraph tests look great. Uh, say it didn't happen. Um, then they go into court and the other individual says, yeah, I made it up so I could get more child support mm-hmm. or I made it up so I could get more custody or, or whatever. And so, when you do those kind of tests and you discover that, um, you know, a person did really well on the test, they passed the test. It feels really good for me to kind of help those people out because I can only imagine what they're going through. And so when people, uh, when you use those polygraph exams to, um, in, you know, and a lot of people say, you know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, so to speak. Sure. So we don't use it. I don't use it in that way. I use it to get as much information as I can, maybe to either, um, say, yes, this is the person that did this. This is who I would look at. Or most definitely, I don't think this is the person that did it based on these results, based on how they answered the questions, based on their body language. Because I've discovered that people um, that are honest will give you the information that you ask for. And they don't take their honesty for granted because they're expected to be believed. Sure. But when someone's trying to convince you they're not the kind of person that would do that, that's a problem. Yeah. So we start digging into that. It, it's kind of cute when, you know, because uh, I think I told you, and everybody knows that the only thing on our televisions in this house probably is, is true crime. But, but that's just true, right? That's just that, always when true. When you talk about Paris Island the last couple of days, I got <clears throat> her to kind of watch uh, Full Metal Jacket a little mm-hmm. bit with me, and she got tickled over that. But um, is, uh, uh, well, I'll watch her watching a show, and she'll comment when they're interviewing somebody, and I've said the same thing, is that, They'll be in a box with somebody and they'll say like a, they'll do a qualifier. They'll do a, a distance, thing, a dissonance thing. And I'll, I'll look over and say, well, that's a, that's a, that's a liar right there. Mm-hmm. Is it because of what you just said? And oh, it's, yeah. it's fun that, uh, to kind of watch that and, and be able to pick that out to where when they're trying to present themselves as somebody they're not, they work a little too hard at it. That was my experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I usually can pick that up on the statement analysis on how yeah. they say something. Cause most people, they'll rehearse a story, but they won't rehearse how to say the story or how to present the story. Ah. And then they most definitely don't rehearse going backwards. Mm-hmm. You know, So people will rehearse what they want to say, but not how to say it. So a lot of times I can pick stuff up just by, you know, someone saying something like, well, I parked the car versus I parked a car. There's a difference between the two. Oh, yes. Right. yes. And so a lot of times when people, you know, start mentioning these things in statement analysis, I can pick this up. And then I start going back and I'm like, okay, let's talk about this car again. And I just start digging in on whatever they're talking about. Okay? Mm. So it's, it's a lot of times on these TV shows, my wife's really, really good at it. Actually women, not to get off topic, but women generally are better at body language than men are. And the reason why is women have 14 to 16 emotional receptors in the brain. Men have about six to eight. I so, knew you all were lacking. So, yeah. So, sorry, guys. It's, it's just the way we're wired. I just wanted so, to talk about polygraphs and yeah. blow her head up to her yeah. get out of the room. So, Thank so, you. Let the man so, continue. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so a lot of times women can pick up on the emotional aspect of body language quicker than men do. Mm-hmm. So my wife's very, very good at it. Yeah. And so it's just one of so those So you things. learned all these good techniques from your wife. I don't know go ahead, go, say it. She's probably going to listen. I don't know mm-hmm. if I'd go that far, but mm-hmm. yeah, she's mm-hmm. she's very good at That's it. That's why they call me motionless Dave in the house. <laughs> right. I just like get real still. Yeah. That way she can't read me. Don't look at her. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't make eye contact. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I mowed the yard. Yeah, yeah, keep my hands in my pockets and don't yeah. fidget. That's right, exactly. Right. So, yeah. It's amazing stuff. And, and again, because uh, we share a lot about what that's like to interview somebody. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things I was just thinking about the other day is when you're interviewing somebody and you're getting tired, how you have to fight the fatigue, because if you're if you don't fight it, you'll miss what you just said, mm-hmm. the, 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 the exchange of one word mm-hmm. and how they refer to a person or a thing mm-hmm. will take you in a completely different directions. And that I still remember that, that when you were really tired, you'd been out and everything. 
is every time you went in there, because you never knew how long you're going to be in there, is is making your stuff stay awake so you could focus because man, you could lose so much on just one word. You you could balk right past an opportunity or a window. And you got to remember that when you're conducting the interview, you're watching their body language, but they're also watching yours. Oh, sure. So you really got to, when I do my interviews at the end of the day, I mean, I am mentally drained. I just go home, take a shower and take a nap. I sure. Mean, it's, it's, sure. Um, Cause you're in, you're in that box, as you say, two, three, four, five hours. It just, Mentally, it just beats you up. but And you got to really control your body language because they're watching you just like you're watching them. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. I, this has exceeded all the expectations. Yeah, Not know, that I didn't think we'd be, I didn't think we wouldn't right, enjoy it. Right. Well, you know, I'm sitting I'm here. I'm over the moon right now. I'm just as blown away as as I was when, when we interviewed the corner because you don't realize all these fine details. That's it. I mean, I knew yeah. what polygraph was. And, and I think our listeners and viewers will say the same thing because it's mm -hmm. one of those things that just gets beat up. Well, the fact it's called ever called a lie detector. Mm -hmm. Somebody didn't do it any favors when they did that. But just the other the other points on that. Simply amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, Eddie, thank you so much for coming in. We have learned so much about what you do. You know, you always I know you said that don't refer to it as lie detector, mm -hmm. but I think he's the. The human lie detector man. Might be. I, I think, think he might be. Yeah. Because I mean, I he's done it for years. I think there was a guy on YouTube or the movies one time that called himself the human lie detector. I think we've so, got him yeah. right here. Yeah. But anyway, Eddie, thank you so much for coming in, sharing with us your career, your past career. Um, I had no idea about the Navy than the Marines. And uh, after sitting there with David watching Full Metal Jacket the other night, I, I don't know whether to be scared of you or just real, real on my best behavior mm. i think i'll go with best behavior yeah she's probably going back to the drill sergeant oh. <laughs> the gunny and the insults okay. that's what we were laughing at mm. aside from that thanks again for being yeah, here thank and, you uh, so much i i guarantee you and in a the listeners, you need to share this with your friends you need to you need to turn people onto this when you hear people talking about a polygraph give them give them this give them the murder police podcast and the channel on youtube and on the whatever your podcast player is and share this because it's one of those things life would be a lot easier if we just all understood this stuff a little mm -hmm. bit better. And, and again, that, that last sage advice, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Amen. Well, thank you, Eddie. Thank You're you, welcome. Eddie. Thank you. Thank you. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims, so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about our presenters, and a link to the official Murder Police Podcast merch store, where you can purchase a huge variety of Murder Police Podcast swag. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed caption for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. Make sure you set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy. <laughs>